Hey everybody, welcome to Tuesday. We're gonna tackle something else difficult, but again, it's an explanatory thing. I did not expect this much coming out of last week's content, but sometimes it's gotta be done, right? If you like me taking the hits so you can get answers to questions some of you are afraid to ask, Help support this channel. Become a monthly patron. Patreon.com slash Leanna K. One dollar a month. If you watch at least one video a week. Come on. Support people working hard for y'all. No. That's a joke. Um, no, it's not. I work very hard. Um, this is not a complete feedback from yesterday's video. This is in response to a tangent from yesterday's video, but also a story that that was in well can you really call it a news when it's, it's the news when it's a twitter phenomenon it's a twitter phenomenon that made the news okay um but this issue of cultural appropriation and what's okay to say what's not okay to say all this stuff some people got really it, it's always weird when people get all bent out of shape over an aside I make. But sometimes it happens and it's valid and I think it should be addressed because it's an ability to kind of get a common set of terminologies. And one, and the thing that got some people jumpy was when I mentioned two spirit people and I said, I don't remember the exact phrase. It could come down to the word I used, but I either said, do not use the term two-spirit unless you are indigenous, and people got mad. Basically, do not use the term two-spirit to refer to yourself or another person unless they are indigenous. And some people were like, some people got nasty. This is not for them. It's the people that were like, why? I don't understand. Why I don't understand is a, t is a valid thing. And this is going to be part of this video, the longer part of the video. But I want to say, say small and sort of work out here. So while this was going on about that issue of, you know, cultural, as I say, misappropriation, because that's what we called it in freaking university anthropology. Um, but Adele is sort of in trouble because she, um, uh, to mark what would have been the Notting Hill Carnival, which seems very similar. This is the first time hearing of the Notting Hill Carnival, but it seems very similar to what we would call Carabana in, uh, or Carabana for Americans. Um, but the <laughs> Notting Hill Carnival was called off due to COVID-19. So Adele put her hair in, in, um, uh, a Jamaican flag bikini um, and, you know, a little a little uh, feathery reference to carnival. But she's also wearing, these are called Bantu knots. And some of you who watch a lot of science fiction may be going, what's wrong with this? Because yes, in certain science fiction shows, um, white women have been depicted in this sort of hairstyle and no one thought anything of it but that's in a sci-fi setting, some people are upset about it. And the question is not, the, 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 the question that is worth answering is not whether or not people should be upset about it. The important thing is why people are upset about it. And it's the same reason that people are upset, certain indigenous people are upset about the two-spirit thing if you're not indigenous. And that, that was one of those comment phenomenons where people are like, why? Why can't, if a word's fine, why can't anybody use it? And then other people in the comments are basically like, thank you for letting people know not to refer to themselves as two-spirit. When it's interesting how the, the people who are directly affected by it, meaning people of indigenous descent, are like, thank you. And other people are like, why? They get all up in arms. Because heaven forbid you're not allowed to use one word. And there's this perception among some that you know well everybody else gets to use this word but I don't that's that's bigotry that's discrimination and that's not what's actually going on again I said in the video 
yesterday, but I will repeat because maybe it didn't come across as clearly. The term two spirit was created to it, it's a catch all term that not all indigenous people like for one, but it was a catch all term to replace a slur used against indigenous peoples for a non-European Christian gender tradition, gender identity tradition. And that that slur, bardash, is basically the word for a male prostitute. So two-spirit people, indigenous two-spirit people were penalized. It was not okay to be two-spirit. It's not, we have this thing that's totally okay for everybody, but you can't use the word. It's the same way that, you know, black people can say the N-word to each other. Though some people still, older people, they'll smack you for that. That is, that is not a universal either. But, you know, growing up, I grew up in a predominantly black neighborhood. We knew they could say it. We couldn't. And we knew why. Because we were never going to get called an N-word. We thought that was simple. But it's the same for the, the Bantu Knots, cornrows. Cornrows were everywhere in when when I was in uh when I was in school uh and it was not uncommon for white people to go to Jamaica and come back with cornrows and I think some people are like yeah so why isn't it okay when Adele does it <sighs> it's one of those things that's complicated and uncomplicated the same thing much like two-spirit replaced a slur and much like two-spirit people were were used and kind of held up up to show the the godless ways of you know indigenous pagan practices and and to to show the rightness it's it's okay that we come over and and take indigenous people's stuff because they need to be civilized for their own good that was one of the things so it's it's it wasn't it wasn't just a thing that people are appreciating people suffered quite badly because people in power didn't like these different cultural practices. Things like cornrows, bantu knots, things like that, it's the same. Um, people have been fired for wearing cornrows to work in the US. This blew me away. This blew my mind because cornrows are normalized in Toronto. There may be businesses that don't allow cornrows, but it's not strange to see um, a, a, a black person wearing cornrows and, and, and they have to be, you know, they have to be neat, right? As long as they're neat, as long as they're well-maintained, then businesses usually out cornrows up here. I've never heard of a business, I could be wrong, but I've never heard of a business in the Toronto area giving someone a hard time for for cornrows or any sort of, you know, um, customary hairstyle, you know? People wear the, um, I forget, there's different names for different things, but the head wraps as well sometimes. These are not considered an issue. Uh, but in certain places, wearing your hair in cornrows can get you fired. It's, it's even schools try to refuse entry to students with, with cornrows because it violates a dress code. It violates some sort of policy. If you're surprised, that's okay. But that's why some people get upset when after all this time, uh, people were punished for cultural hairstyles now all of a sudden it's cool so white people are doing it. That's that's the raw nerve there. That's the raw nerve. And it's important to recognize this. It's not it's not a question of right or wrong. It's a question of sensitive or insensitive. And this is an important thing when we talk about these sorts of touchy issues, especially when it comes to race, but also gender, sexuality, gender identity, all that stuff. Um, I wish I could just say gender and it, 
envelopes gender identity, but that's a disputed thing. So I'm being considerate. I'm being sensitive to both sides of that debate. Uh, More on that on Feedback Friday. But we're living in a time of a lot of... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> a lot of contradictory messaging, right? Um, some people want to... <sighs> terminal. I don't want to get too hung up on terminologies because I think it's more important uh, to understand what a person is trying to say with their communication than to nitpick on words because no terminology is going to be perfect. Um I say this as somebody who's a heavily abstracted thinker, so words are just placeholders for different colored cloud bubbles for me. It's like, oh, here's an idea. This is what we call this idea today. I don't necessarily call that idea that idea, but I can have an idea without having a name for it. Apparently not everyone can do that. Now, I suspect a lot of people on this channel can um, because if it's like, oh, I have this idea. I don't have a name for it. I make up a name. That idea's name is Steve, you know? That idea's name is, well, Karen's taken, but, you know, Annie. We're going to name that idea Annie. What does Annie mean? It's just a placeholder name for that idea. It's code, right? Like, you just set the name of the variable, and as long as you call that variable the same thing everywhere, the computer reads it, right? Right, okay. Um, But we now have this idea that certain phrases or certain terminologies are inherently aggressive, even if somebody doesn't intend it as such. And we get into this microaggression idea. And I'm going to tell you guys right now, I cannot stand microaggression theory because there's nothing micro about an aggression. And my issue with microaggression theory is it's lumping together two completely different behaviors into one classification. And you just said terms don't mean anything, but when you're using the same term to to refer to two separate things, that drives my abstraction-driven brain crazy because instead of individual bubbles you you are muddying up my bubble, my little bubbles of idea. You're 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 violating my bubbles here. But I know this is weird. That's why they're abstractions. But you have the one behavior, which is essentially people using deliberate dog whistles to tweak someone. It is a deliberate abuse of power. They're doing it because they can. They know what they're doing. They're being an asshole. That's one bucket of behaviors. The other bucket of behaviors, actually, there's two more. The other bucket of behaviors is behaviors that are wrong but the person doing it doesn't realize they're wrong and doesn't see it as wrong because they were raised to understand that this was actually being polite right um then there's then there's the thing that it's actually not wrong it's just a sensitivity some people have and and that uh, i felt so bad for Rachel Maddow I love Rachel Maddow, but one night of the R- the the Trump National Convention, aka the RNC, um, Rachel Maddow went on at length about how well spoken this particular speaker, who was a black woman who was pardoned by President Trump, was, and she kept saying how well spoken this woman was and how well spoken this woman was, and I just could just imagine. Joy Reid off air going, "Uh, do you realize what you just said there? And I'm sure she felt terrible about it afterwards because that's one of those things. This is a clash of things. There's a sensitivity to that because it's this assumption thing, right? White people tend to praise each other by saying someone is well-spoken. It's actually a classist thing. In, in British cultures, because there are some accents that show you're, you're well-educated and or come from money. And then there's other accents that indicate you come from working stock. And, um, you know, my, my stepfather, rest in peace, his accent was actually retrained as, as he went through education 
when when I met his his sister from from Stockport for the first time, like their accents weren't the same. And I was like, whoa, that's how language driven class in England works. So it's nothing of it for one one white person to another white person referring to each other as well spoken. And I never understood why it bugged me to be given that compliment because the tradition I came up in is that well-spoken, if somebody goes, oh, you're so well-spoken, why did you assume I wouldn't be? You know, why? Because I'm a hood kid? You think I couldn't talk good? That that was the natural reaction. And obviously that, you know, that was informed by race and class because because of that assumption that black people are not articulate, right? No harm was meant. That is something that, that should just go by. Just be aware for next time. You handle that very differently. Like, be aware that's a sensitivity, right? Not, you is racist. Um, but then there's this other thing that, I mean, the movie Clerks 2 handled so beautifully in the scene of I'm not going to repeat the term but Jason Muse Muse's character uh it was Jason Muse wasn't it I think it was um but you know his grandmother used to use this term all the time and it's a horribly racist term and he kept repeating it because it was normalized in his family and he didn't know it was bad and everybody uh, was it Dante kept going don't say that stop saying that you know um it, it was it was funny because I think a lot of people can relate to that. And that that is not just a a white culture thing. There is a real issue, um, you know, where, where um, I grew up with certain older immigrant groups. So first sort of sorry, sorry second and third generation Canadians, but especially third genera generation Canadian and back of any race doing things that, y y you know, it wasn't, nobody kind of realized at the time was racist, but it was pretty racist to the newer immigrant waves, which were more likely Asian, Middle Eastern and South Asian, right? Um, and <sighs> there was no deep-seated hatred there was no lasting harm intended in that it was an attempt to make light of difference not realizing how hurtful it is because a lot of it had to do with an inability to be fluent in English right or or accented language or something like that I mean the the black kids were just as bad for that as the white kids were because no, nobody said anything. Uh, eventually, somebody was like, you know, it's not it's not their fault. If you think their English isn't good, why don't you help them with their English instead of instead of making fun of them? And I was all for, yeah, OK, I'll help you read. I'm useful. Woohoo! It means I won't get beat up this week. I'm useful to somebody that that is how I avoid getting getting beat it up. And beat it up. That is how I avoided getting beat up in a very rough school. If you're useful, people leave you alone. Cause it's like, no, I, I, you know, I want her to help me with my homework. I want to help me with this assignment. Leave her alone. She's useful. That's how I got by. Um, so that was, you know, that, that no problem for me, but these are, these are different issues, right? You treat somebody differently when there's a recognition that there actually isn't anything inherently bad with saying someone's well-spoken. It's just a sensitive point, you know, because of stereotypes. Someone may or may not be aware of that stereotype based on a, a, a whole bunch of factors. So you, you got to sort of rule out and it's tough because when something hits you the wrong way and you're having an emotional response, you know, who who is the adult in the room in that moment? The person who's having an understandable emotional response, the other person who's going, whoa, what I do? You you need somebody to kind of be the adult in the room, but then you have to be really careful not to speak for other people. That's one management challenge. And um, 
you know, <laughs> that I, I learned how to get better. I'm still not great at it. It's a difficult skill. I learned to get better at <laughs> asking people if they would like assistance as opposed to just assuming that they want help because I would want help dealing with people with disabilities because that's a big thing I had to, you know, I had to learn. Being helpful is often seen as condescending. Don't give someone who who has a, a visible disability help unless they ask for it. It's okay to say, would you like help? Would you like me to help you with this door or something like that? And then they can say yes, instead of always being the person that other people uh, need to do things for. And I know that's an empathy thing too, right? Because people would, most people would like, it'd be great if people were doing all this stuff for me. That's because you don't need them to, right? It's a different, it's a different framing. And understanding different framings is the core of this. Because then you get, you know, that other group of people who, and, and this is the tough one. These are the people I think are feeling exceptionally under siege right now. And I, I'm sympathetic, even though, you know, there are certain things that do have to stop. People who were raised with traditions that do need to change because they do, um, they do minimize the experiences of other people there still needs to be a certain amount of kindness done because in a lot of these instances, especially when it comes to gender, but also certain other things, people think they're being nice by being more polite to women, nicer to women, you know, but that comes from the fact that women are weaker and more emotionally fragile than men. And that stuff drives me crazy. If I feel like somebody's going easy on me, it's an indication that they don't respect me. Now, I don't want somebody going harder on me either, right? Equality is equality. Um, and one of the things about visibility that we have to be super aware of, if, if there is somebody who is noticeably different, you know, one of these things is not like the other. Remember, I was talking about yesterday, same and different. Um, they do tend to be more visible, and they tend to get corrected more often because they are more visible. And that's something we have to be really super aware of. But again, if a person doesn't realize they're doing anything wrong, freaking out on them and calling them a bad person isn't going to do very much, right? The thing about family traditions, <laughs> and I went through this with some of the the things like in 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 my family and in other people's like friends who are of Dutch abstra uh, extraction and it, it, you know are are <laughs> still do like Sparta Pete things um <laughs> how do you explain <laughs> some people get it other people take longer to get what that looks like to somebody who's not part of that tradition um, I'm not going to get into what that is. If you don't know what it is, don't worry about it. If you do know what it is, you're chuckling right now because, yeah. Um, <laughs> but you get into this thing of, does that mean that the relatives that did this, the relatives that taught me this, does this mean they're bad people? And usually the answer is no. Usually it's behaviors that were normalized that fortunately we've evolved beyond. Language always changes. Traditions always change. And there's usually a way to adapt traditions instead of just getting rid of them. My mother-in-law and I have this ongoing thing about the orange on the Seder plate. She thinks it's a desecration. I think it's inclusive. Um, the orange on the Seder, Seder plate is added as a, a nod to women in Judaism because most of the traditional books are written he, him. And so, you know, it's it's this dated idea that um, the, you know, it, it was, uh, it, it's apocryphal. But this idea that some traditionalists are like a woman has as much role on the bima, meaning, you know, the prayer area, um, as an orange has on a Seder plate. And so we put an orange on a Seder plate as a symbol of equality. Um, it's a desecration to traditionalists. Too bad. 
I still do it. Um, and that's a power struggle, but we have to constantly question our traditions, not attack our traditions, not hate our traditions, but question them. Then there's that very first group that, and, and I should say that questioning traditions, this constant state of self-reflection, people like me are good with that. Some people have a really hard time with it for, for various, you know, mental and emotional reasons. We need some kindness. We need some understanding in that process that everybody has to give some so that one person's not giving everything. That's that's the ideal space, right? Where everybody's a little bit uncomfortable so nobody's very uncomfortable, right? A little bit of discomfort people can handle. It's kind of fun. You're learning, right? A lot of discomfort is debilitating. Uh, you know, that's the point where discomfort becomes pain. Um, when, you know, whenever you know you're having a medical procedure and they say it will, it, you will, may experience some discomfort, that means it's going to hurt. It's that sort of thing, right? Uh, a little bit of discomfort, okay. Like the bug bite I have on the bottom of my foot. Itchy, ah, but I can still function. It's not the same as, you know, losing a toe. Um, that first group, the problem is at that first group, the people who damn well know what they're doing and they're doing it deliberately, hide amongst the other groups. They use people's lack of awareness, culture clashes to hide in plain sight. And they use it so that because it's very hard to prove intense and they just cry ignorance every time they're caught. Those people are, are, are a real challenge. Those people are a real issue. The, one of the things that drives me crazy is when somebody gets upset, someone's go-to is, why are you being so aggressive? It's like, well, someone's being aggressive because you were rude, you know, or you did something that upset them and they're trying to talk to you and you're shutting them down. You know, why are you being so aggressive often isn't a sincere question. It isn't a, I want to know what I did. It's a shutdown tactic, right? We have, we have denormalized anger. Some people think anger is always a bad thing. And bad actors are using that to sow dissent. Anger is very helpful sometimes. People, um get angry sometimes. There's a difference between being angry and being abusive. And you know you're an adult when you can recognize that person deserves to be pissed off at me. You know, they they shouldn't be like calling you names or anything like that. But, you know, understanding that you screwed up and you understand why someone's upset. You wonder why somebody's, why someone's annoyed with you. That's a mark of adulthood because it shows you can recognize you made a mistake, but it's not the end of the world, right? Some people prefer to be talked to right away. Some people need some time to cool off. Both are valid. It's important to work that process. People who shut down bad responses, some people are just emotionally mature. Some people, it's learned behavior. Again, we're in those three buckets, right? But then there are some people that actually use it as a weapon to get themselves out of trouble. And those are the people that can destroy an environment. It can destroy a team. It can destroy a community. And those are the people that we have to identify and do something about. Those are the people that are very unlikely to change because they like starting trouble. And increasingly, and, and this is my question to you guys, what do you guys do when you have a friend who you know is a troll? They delight in upsetting people. It's, it's a power thing. They like being able to get a rise out of people. And, 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 you know, I've asked a few people I know that are like that. I say, why do you do that? And there are as many reasons as there are people. But these are people who, no matter what their reasons, are deliberately upsetting people. 
And that's the worst thing anybody can be doing right now because everything's so charged. Like you turn on the news and it's just yikes. Like even up here in Canada, our news is filled with what's going on in the U.S. because we're freaking human beings, right? We have issues up here, especially involving indigenous peoples, but it's on a totally different level what's going on in the U.S. And we look at it and we're human beings and we're like, dear God, what do we do? And I think the only thing most of us can do since we're not in charge of, you know, major power structures is <coughs> be aware of this stuff. Stop having such knee-jerk reactions to change, to finding out that, <laughs> oh, out of sensitivity, just don't use a handful of phrases out of sensitivity for other people. The same way I didn't talk about men's issues until you guys said it was okay. Same principle, right? It's respect. It's putting in a little bit of work so people can see you give a damn. That's it. But also, it doesn't take very long for somebody who's a bad actor to show who they really are. And <laughs> people tolerate people like that, out of a misguided sense of fairness. And either everybody gets treated with the zero tolerance anti-racism thing, which doesn't work because it makes it harder to root out the truly bad actors. Or they just, out of a sense of fairness, everybody deserves another chance. And then it's another chance. And then it's another chance. And it's another chance. And that's weak leadership. But of course, they they would rather have a discriminatory workplace or social circle than possibly have somebody be directly mad at them because they made a decision that the needs of the many outweighed the needs of this one person. They weren't willing to step up and say, no, I have to have this person hate my guts because it's the right thing to do. And that I find more frustrating than anything. As somebody who gets in a lot of trouble for doing the right thing, even when it's hard, this video is a shining example of that. Um, I do not get that sort of cowardice. And that's what it is. And do nothing leaders are going to have to be replaced because, hey, they did nothing on this situation that didn't involve you or may have gone your way. Imagine when you have a problem and they do nothing. Exactly. All right. Hopefully you found this video useful. Help support this channel. Become a monthly patron. Patreon.com slash Shanna K. Thanks for watching.